we're gonna make our own little watershed. Welcome to Port Bruce Harbor. This is a blue ash tree, the most rare species of ash you can find in Ontario. Yarmouth is one of the best examples of what conservation authorities and hard work can do for restoring and conserving and managing a local ecosystem. Hi everyone, my name's Ranger M and I work at Catfish Creek Conservation Authority. I'm the community outreach technician and that means I do a lot of this, chatting about all things nature and conservation with kids, adults, teachers, everyone. I love to knowledge share and that's just what I'm going to do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. Today we're going to learn about conservation authorities and watersheds. There are 36 conservation authorities across Ontario. They are mandated to protect, restore and manage Ontario's waters and natural habitats through programs that balance economic, social and environmental needs. All of Ontario's 36 conservation authorities fall under the Conservation Authorities Act, which was created in 1946 by the Ontario Provincial Government. Conservation authorities, or CAs, were created due to water worries and a decline in forestry products in Ontario. Many farmers across Ontario were dealing with regular flooding and water shortages due to dried up wells. Foresters were worried about their lumber products because they were cutting down forests and they knew forestry was a renewable resource but would take a long time to regrow. Therefore, foresters needed guidance and assistance on how to grow their forests in a proper and sustainable manner where farmers needed just answers to their water questions and conservation authorities were born. Conservation authorities are not limited by the boundary of a city or a town or a municipality. Each conservation authority has multiple municipalities represented within their watershed. Each CA is overseen by a board of directors and each board of director is a representative of a municipality. The board of directors help make policies and pass motions for each CA. The board of directors help the CAs make decisions and policies that benefit both their municipalities and the watershed as a whole. About 90% of Ontario's population lives within a conservation authority watershed. So that's about 12 million people living within a watershed. Conservation authorities partner with municipal, provincial and federal governments, as well as landowners and other groups on community based projects. Conservation authorities have worked with thousands of landowners on resource management and watershed stewardship projects. This has included tree planting, wetland restoration, planting tall grass prairie species, improving water quality, and low water strategy projects. Let's back up and understand what a watershed means. What do you think a watershed is? What do you think a watershed is? A watershed is an area of land where all the water underneath the ground or drains off the ground collects into the same place. So we're going to focus on the Catfish Creek Conservation Authority watershed. And I bet you guessed it, that means it's Catfish Creek. So this is Catfish Creek within our watershed. You can see we don't have a boundary based on a city or a town because here's the town of Elmer, here's the city of St. Thomas, and up there would be London. So we cover all of these areas because Catfish Creek goes through all of these areas. So we can trace it right here and it empties into Lake Erie at Port Bruce. This water includes all of the rain, snow melt and runoff that will enter and drain into the Catfish Creek and then enter into Lake Erie. In London, the same thing happens to the Thames River. But the Thames is so long and big that they had to divide it into two the Upper Thames Region and the Lower Thames Region Conservation Authorities that work together to protect the Thames River and that watershed. So now I'll show you what I mean through an example. We're gonna make our own little watershed. So here I have a tray that's gonna represent the watershed. And then I have a couple pieces of Tupperware that are going to act as the hills and mounds of a natural landscape. I'm gonna put my bag over top so we ask ourselves when we spray the water, which represents rain, snow melt, anything like that on our watershed, what will happen? So we can see the water ran down our mountains and our hills and our valleys, creating little streams down and then creating pools of water 
and more creeks and rivers that will eventually empty into a bigger space, like this one let's say, that will be our lake. Another thing you can try with your watershed is seeing how pollution affects water quality by adding food coloring and watching the water carry the food coloring throughout your watershed. One more thing you can try with your activity is adding solid uh, objects like paper shavings, paper clips, and seeing the water force those things around your watershed as well. Now that we know a little bit more about watersheds, we're gonna go head out to Port Bruce to learn more about flooding and ice management. One of the main roles of conservation authorities is natural hazard management. Each CA works to protect human life and property from natural hazards. Two of the main ones are flooding and erosion. Flooding is most common in the spring when our snow melts, putting water into the creek, causing large chunks of ice to move down the creek. As the large chunks of ice move down the creek coming towards the lake, it also brings a lot of water and sediment with them. This causes the water to go up over the shoreline, causing flooding and potentially damage to property and human life. This is known as ice jamming and the most common reason for flooding in this part of Ontario. At Catfish Creek Conservation Authority, we have a water technician and it's his job to collect data and evaluate the information based on flood forecasting and mapping. This allows him to forecast our floods so he can put out warnings to municipalities and the public for when floods could happen. We then work with local companies that help us break up the ice to make sure that the water and the ice keep moving out of the harbour to keep the flooding to a minimum. Our water technician also does the same in drought situations, so when we're getting really low on water. He puts out a warning to the public so they can work to conserve their water and prepare for a drought situation. We also have a resource planning technician and he works with landowners to help them use natural remedies so that they can lessen their impact from drought and flooding. And this leads us to erosion. You can actually see erosion is happening on the shoreline behind me. This is a natural process where water and wind work away at the shoreline to take the sediment off the shoreline into the water and it actually carries it down the lake. Even though it's natural, it is happening at an increased rate, which is causing an unstable shoreline. So anyone who lives up on that shoreline has unstable ground below them, and this could cause damage to their property and their life. So our resource planner technician works with landowners to reestablish natural buffers and to prevent people from building on these unstable grounds. What are some of the causes of flooding? What are some of the causes of flooding? Flooding is caused by heavy rain, snow melt, and ice jamming in the harbor. Another responsibility of conservation authorities is to restore, protect, and conserve Ontario's waters, lands, and natural resources. In our previous episode, we were at Springwater Conservation Area, one of our more well-known conservation areas. But today, we're actually at Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area, a needed refuge for sensitive plants and animals in a very special place halfway between Springwater Conservation Area and the Catfish Creek Valley and Floodplain Forest. This special placement of Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area allows for wildlife corridors. It connects disconnected ecosystems, allowing for better genetic diversity, more biodiversity, and a better habitat for our wildlife. Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area has a rich history. It has a bottomland forest and a large remnant of the Carolinian Valley Slope that was used for glacial spillway. About 20 years ago, this area was in serious decay. It was used as a gravel extraction for many, many decades, and then it was left abandoned and barren. After being depleted and abandoned, this spot was used as a local hangout and also known as the snake pit. The pit was used for a dumping ground and also a dirt biking area. The dirt bikes tore through, ripping up environmentally sensitive plants and leaving the ground barren, allowing rain to just sweep the nutrients off the landscape and into the creek. The team at Catfish Creek Conservation Authority saw the potential of what this land could become and started the process of acquiring the land in 1998. This was actually one of the first places in Ontario that went under the ecological land classification system. 
it took years to what used to be the snake pit to become an area where wildlife and plant life would come back and flourish to even more years to what it would become today. 200 acres of forested land, a 24 acre wetland, and several acres of tall grass prairie. Yarmouth is one of the best examples of what conservation authorities and hard work can do for restoring and now working towards conserving and managing a local ecosystem. Personally, it's one of my favorite properties. So let's go check out the Herb Kevel wetland. This is the Herb Kebble wetland, a 24 acre bioengineered wetland. Bioengineered just meaning we built it. Bioengineering means we use biological, mechanical, and ecological concepts to construct something. So we use the natural landscape to make sure that this wetland could act like a wetland. So we made sure that it could drain water when it was too full and it could hold water in a drought situation as well. We touched on this in Port Bruce, that erosion and stabilization issues are very common along our shorelines and our creek banks. Bioengineering helps us reduce the slope, making it more gradual, as well as collect those nutrients and sediment and other runoff that goes into the water. There's also other added benefits like it cools the water, helps reduce stream widening, as well as provide habitat and food for wildlife, and even provide recreational opportunities for us. We've completed several bioengineering projects here at Yarmouth, as well as our other conservation authority known as Archie Coulter CA. We also have completed several on private and public lands along the Catfish Creek. Many streams have bank stabilization and erosion control issues, not just the Catfish Creek. But a lot of these issues do arise from anthropogenic changes. What does anthropogenic mean? Anthropogenic means that any issues or changes to nature have arisen because of human activity. Since the Catfish Creek watershed is mostly agricultural based, we'll discuss some farming practices that could impact our creek health. We tend to farm right up to the edge of the stream, taking away any vegetation or trees that could be there, but that vegetation actually is really important. It's known as the riparian buffer zone. And it actually filters out pollutants, cools the stream water, prevents stream widening, and holds down the sediment to prevent erosion and sedimentation in the water. Once the vegetation is gone, the sediment can run freely into the water. As the sediment runs into the water and erodes away from the bank, our banks get steeper and wider. As the stream gets wider, our water in the stream actually gets warmer. And warm water can negatively impact our fish populations. And more sediment in the water can actually cause sedimentation which decreases habitat availability and negatively impacts our fish health as well. The final stage of the bioengineering is planting all of those native plant species along the stream bank. And that can help prevent a lot of those issues. It'll decrease the amount of sediment going in the water. It'll provide shade and cool down the water for our fish, as well as providing an aesthetically pleasing environment. Now, wetland restoration was the first stage for this project. Also, we did reforestation. So let's go check out the spot where some trees were planted. Just like in Springwater Conservation Area, we are also trying to reintroduce the American chestnut here in Yarmouth. So these are little tiny chestnut trees. We have planted around a thousand chestnuts here at Yarmouth and with another thousand trees planned to be planted this fall or early next spring. To give you some background on the American chestnut, it, before the 1940s, it was one of the most common trees in the Carolinian life zone. It represented 25% of the tree species in a mixed forest stand. Early in the 1900s, a plant pathogen was introduced to the United States of America from Asia. And that plant pathogen was called the chestnut blight. The blight quickly traveled up through the United States and into Canada, wiping out 99% of our American chestnut trees. That is approximately one and a half to two million trees. The blight actually only affects the above ground part of the tree. So it causes a canker that girdles and kills the branches and the trunks of the tree. But the root systems that are below the ground are able to still regenerate and allow sprouts to come up and hopefully bear some nuts. The sprouts do eventually normally 
die because of the blight, but they are sometimes able to have those nuts and allow for future growth. The American chestnut is classified as endangered under the Endangered Species Act, which protects it from being collected, harmed, or killed. Unfortunately, the chestnut blight is still active and present in the environment today. It was not killed off when the American chestnut almost was, and it's not very likely that the blight will be stopped or eradicated. Uh, but it is the hope that a blight-resistant gene of the American chestnut will be able to survive the blight in the future. The Canadian Chestnut Council is working towards creating a blight-resistant breeding program. So they collect nuts from American chestnut trees that have shown strong resistance towards the blight and pollinated them to create little sapling American chestnuts to plant in different properties. Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area being one of them. Reforestation is a major component of any restoration project and has been for several decades. Catfish Creek Conservation Authority has planted over 600,000 trees since 1990. And in Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area, we went through a rigorous reforestation program that continues to this day. Every year we plant several hundred different native species that include sycamore trees, several different maple trees, oak trees, white pine, and other species. Now there's over 200 acres of successful Carolinian forest here. And I say successful because it is. In terms of bird diversity alone, there's the same amount of bird diversity here as in Springwater Forest, which is over 500 years old and didn't have to go through gravel extraction and motorbikes to get there. Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area is doing a great job. So let's go check out a couple different tree species. This is a blue ash tree. Not only is it the most rare species of ash you can find in Ontario, but it's also listed as threatened. So it's incredibly lucky that we can find it here at Yarmouth. It's easily distinguishable by its square branches and twigs, and it normally has some scaly bark too. And it gets its name blue ash from the sticky substance that where you find when you peel back the bark, it turns blue when it's exposed to the air. So we've discussed wetland restoration, reforestation, and the final stage for Yarmouth was tall grass prairie restoration. So that was pretty easy, just putting in plugs of tall grass prairie species, wild native flowers, and um, letting it do its own thing. Mostly we can just leave them be, and every few years we come in and do a prescribed burn. Tall grass prairies are an extremely important ecosystem and an actually a very at-risk ecosystem. There's less than 1% of the original tall grass prairies found in southwestern Ontario still remaining today. They have a very strong root structure and they're actually known as upside down forests because their roots can get up to five meters long. They stabilize sediment and they provide a lot of nutrients for our soils. Also, finally, they provide food and habitat for a lot of species, ranging from reptiles to birds to mammals. What's your favorite recreational activity to participate in when you visit a conservation area? What's your favorite recreational activity to participate in when you visit a conservation area? My favorite activity at Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area is bird watching. I have seen bald eagles, the pileated woodpecker, indigo bunting, and many more here. At Springwater Forest, I love to kayak and hike. Sometimes there's confusion around conservation authorities and what they are and what they actually do. So on our social media pages, we said, if you could ask a conservation authority employee anything, what would you ask? And here are some questions. Do we find conservation authorities anywhere else in Canada? Actually, conservation authorities are completely unique to Ontario. They were created by the Ontario government back in 1946. They are unique to Ontario, but other places in the world have used the Conservation Authorities Act to create their own policies and acts. What do conservation authorities really do? As explained earlier, conservation authorities have a lot of roles, but they mostly fit into the following. Watershed management. So we monitor and report on our watershed on an entire watershed basis to make sure that our decisions are good for the entire watershed. Flood and erosion control. This is one of our most important roles to help control and prevent natural hazards. Water quality and quantity management. 
We will get into this more, but water quality is really important to monitor because clean and safe water is really important for human health and wildlife health. Water quantity is really important to monitor as well because as we've touched on, flood and drought conditions need to constantly be monitored and reported on. Fun fact about the Catfish Creek Conservation Authority, it was actually one of the first conservation authorities created in 1950 because of uh, low water table conditions. Natural heritage protection. This means we're working to protect and manage our sensitive lands. Sensitive lands could be springwater forests, for example. Springwater forest is a mature, old growth Carolinian forest. We are always looking to protect and manage springwater forest. Watershed stewardship. This is for projects when we work with landowners, partner municipalities, other organizations and stakeholders on programs like water quality, woodlot management, fish and wildlife projects, or rehab and restoration projects. Technical support for land use planning. This is when we provide advice, input, data, and reviews on different projects that community members or partner municipalities will complete. And finally, we have education and recreation. Just like we're doing here today, we provide outdoor and environmental education to both youth and adults. We do lots of festivals like water festivals, our annual maple syrup festival. We have this Carolinian forest festival that takes place in spring water where we focus on all things the Carolinian life zone has to offer. And finally, we have Marsh Quest, which we do at Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area that focuses on wetlands. CAs also provide safe space for recreation. A lot of the common activities include hiking, canoeing, kayaking, bird watching, and then some of the special ones are campgrounds, like we have the Springwater Campground, and then other CAs provide golf courses and even ski hills. These recreational opportunities are normally created to provide a revenue to offset other mandatory programs like our flood and erosion control program. How do conservation authorities receive their funding and money to pay for all of the stuff they do? Our funding comes from several different avenues. When conservation authorities first started, it was 50% from the provincial government and 50% from municipalities. What it looks more like today is this. 3% federal, 3% provincial, 30% municipal levies, 54% self-generated revenue like the Springwater Campground, 4% donations and sponsorships, and 6% other grants. Municipal levies come from our partner municipalities that are part of our watershed. This means we get part of the taxes that private citizens or property owners pay to their municipalities. This equals out to about $10 to $15 per person per year, depending on where you live in Ontario. Thanks to everyone who asked the question, and thanks to you for joining me and learning about conservation authorities in Ontario. Before we go, let's look over the activity we tried earlier in the episode to learn about watersheds. You'll need a pan or a shallow, long container, a spray bottle with water, some objects of random sizes, a plastic sheet, and some food coloring or markers. Place the pan down and scatter the objects. Lay the plastic sheet over top and then spray the highest objects with water. Then add some food coloring or color the plastic with markers. What does the water represent? What happened at the highest and lowest points? What watershed do you live and where does it empty? 